Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm sure we'll have a few more people still uh, coming into the room, but um, let's make a start. So my name is Stephen Young. I am an, uh, I'm not an associate, but I'm a full professor now of geography and international studies uh, here at UW-Madison. I'm also the faculty director of IRIS NRC or the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center. IRIS NRC is the main sponsor for today's event. And we support and enhance global awareness and inspire informed thinking about the complexities of our world and do this by providing resources and expertise to uh, K-12 and post-secondary educators, as well as stu students and the community at large here. Uh, I also want to thank our co-sponsors, Asian American Studies and the Department of Geography at UW Medicine. Um, Essie Lenchner will be running the tech support for today's event. If you have any challenges, please use the chat function to uh, contact her. Um, we will be recording today's event and showing the link and digital resources in a, po a post event email, but you'll only show on the recording if your microphone is turned on to speak during the Q&A session. Um, before we get started, I want to read the UW-Madison line acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place yeah. the nation has called the Job since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Wendy Cheng, for the book club. Uh, Wendy is a professor of American studies at Scripps College and core faculty in the Intercollegiate Department of Asian American Studies. Uh, her research uh, focuses on race and ethnicity, comparative racialization, critical geography, urban and suburban studies and diaspora. And um, as you will see from the talk and, and read in the book, if you uh, receive one of our uh, copies. She really is a geographer by by training and is a, and is a, a very spatial thinker and as you're about to find out, a, a Madisonian by birth as well, no less. Her book, The Chang's Next Door to the Diaz's, Remapping Race in Suburban and California, won the 2014 Book Award from the American Sociological Association section on Asia and Asian American, uh, uh, Asian America. And her co-authored book, A People's Guide to Los Angeles, uh, for which he was also the photographer, won the Associ Association of American Geographers Globe Book Award for Public Understanding of Geography. And she has very generously agreed to join us today to talk about her most recent book, which I've been reading, and which is a fabulous piece of, of scholarship and, and as well as an excellent piece of, of writing on a really important topic. The title of the book is Island X, Taiwanese Student Migrants, Campus Spies and Cold War Activism. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Wendy Cheng. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Stephen, for that generous introduction and um, to IRIS NRC, um, Asian American Studies, and the Department of Geography for um, the invitation and supporting my visit here. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, um, it feels particularly special to be giving this talk in Madison because this book like me, has its roots here. Um, and I'll just start sharing slides, let's see. Hmm. Okay, so there's the title slide. Um, let me rearrange the windows so I can see everything. Okay. So my parents were graduate students at University of Wisconsin. That's them um, having freshly arrived from the subtropical island of Taiwan in 1972, sitting on frozen Lake Mendota um, in 1972. Um, so my first home was my parents' graduate student apartment in Eagle Heights. Um, my dad, Tseng De Tang or Edward Chang, um, who passed away in 2015. Um, he got his PhD in nuclear engineering 
here at University of Wisconsin and subsequently spent his career researching fusion energy. Um, but after he retired, he became the poet and writer he had always wanted to be. So I'd like to begin um, my sharing of my book today by reading a poem that my father wrote about his time in Madison as a young graduate student in the 1970s. And it's called Visiting Old Places, um, Visiting Old Places to Say Goodbye to the Past. I returned to a place where life began to say goodbye to the past, recalling an era, the last of a memory. State Street in 1972, a very cold night after Christmas, we met a man with a face full of misery and talked with him for a while. Two days later, we received a letter from him. My dear friends, you saved me. Last night, I wanted to end my life. Now I hope I can start a new life. Bless you too. Innocent us, we were confused and mystified. Now in 2004, much of the year has already passed. Those mysteries, that lost man and his new life and the blessing he gave us then. After the relentless passage of time, it doesn't mean anything anymore. The memory has faded and become blank. In 1975, Saigon fell. The student newspaper said it was liberation. The students celebrated occupying State Street. They said they would change the name to Ho Chi Minh Street. Around that time, some students from Vietnam, sympathetic to Ho Chi Minh, came to visit this, quote, American imperialist campus, end quote, moving freely there, unthinkable, and accu accusing the American imperialists of invading their country. Thinking of memories from that time, new green buds sprouting on the trees, and apple blossoms and lilac blooming in the spring, more mosquitoes and gnats in the darker green of summer, and the ground covered with fallen leaves and the orange of autumn. Of course, there was also the freezing cold and white snow of winter. Memories of a snow country, those are the most vivid, are deeply embedded in my heart. Let's bury them. Instead, bring the expectation of spring with completely new hopes. Don't look back while boarding a vessel of fate headed toward an unknown destination. So I was really fascinated um, by this poem, um, particularly by these two stanzas. And when I interviewed my dad for the research that eventually became this book, he brought up this moment of encounter with Vietnamese students critical of the US again. And he said, I just wonder how is it possible because there was a war going on and these people are supposed to be enemies of the US how could they come to the US and then talk about how the US invaded them? This is unthinkable if you were in Taiwan. So I think this is probably how democracy and freedom thinking works to allow this kind of contradictory, but fantastic thing. When I did a little more research on this, I realized that the moment my father remembers is also significant because the young Vietnamese man who spoke at the University of Wisconsin was likely a member of the Union of Vietnamese. The Union of Vietnamese was a US-based grassroots organization of Vietnamese individuals opposed to the war, founded by students who had come to the US on US um, Agency for International Development, USAID scholarships. The, stu the students' pro-US stance was assumed and they had not been expected or intended to develop such a critique. However, as Mei Fu puts it, quote, their enrollment in US universities initiated the beginning of an unexpected political education, end quote. So the sharing of space on a US campus here in Madison between two Asian student migrants, each expressing or developing his political views in a circumstance created simultaneously by US materialism and apparent US benevolence is an important window into Asian American political histories that are still relatively unknown and was indeed, as my dad put it, a contradictory but fantastic thing. So my book tells the political story of this generation of Taiwanese student migrants to the US in the context of US-Taiwan relations and global Cold War history. Part one situates Taiwan in relationship to the US and provides an overview of the educational and social networks and how they served as a structure for political activism. I also discuss some less well-known, more radical and leftist strands that emerged from Taiwanese political activism during the 1970s and 1980s. Part two looks at three specific cases of Taiwanese migrants, Huang Qiming, Chen Yuxi, and Chen Wenchen, who met with KMT state violence, including arrest, imprisonment, and murder 
on the basis of their alleged political activities while li living in the US. Um, in my um, brief presentation today, I'm going to first give an overview of the structure of student migration to the US and talk about how the conditions for both activism and surveillance were created. Then I'm gonna highlight at the end, just um, some of the Madison and Mid Midwest specific events and dynamics of this, this history. And I hope we will have um, plenty of time for discussion after that. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. So from the 1960s to the 1980s, um, during um, Taiwan's 38, period of, 38 year period of martial law, over 100,000 Taiwanese went to the US as part of American initiatives to continue building Cold War knowledge, um, power and knowledge and science, technology and engineering fields. They were able to do so because of the special ally relationship between the US and Taiwan as the Republic of China. And those of you who are Chinese speakers or um, and come from Taiwan are probably familiar with this saying, um, Lai 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 Mei Guo, uh, sorry, Lai 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 Tai Da Chi 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 Mei Guo. So it's, you know, like, First, you go to National Taiwan University, um, the most prestigious university in Taiwan, and then naturally from there you go to America because whole um, portions of graduating classes in the departments of physics, engineering, and so on um, would just naturally take that path because at the time there were not um, there were not any opportunities for graduate study in Taiwan, um, so this pathway was created. Um, however, what is less well known is that. Although Ameri uh, Taiwanese in the US are often regarded as the sort of quintessential model minority group, many Taiwanese of this generation were in fact overwhelmingly political, shaped by multiple imperial and colonial histories and influenced by the global social movements of their times. And these are just some of the um, books that and materials that they were both reading and producing. Of course, you know, some of them would get here and immediately go to all the um, Asian libraries that they could at the universities that were they were at. There was even someone I interviewed who bought a $50 See America Greyhound bus ticket and went all over the country going to different Asian libraries at universities to read everything that he had been forbidden from reading in Taiwan. And so, of course, they were very curious about Maoism. Um, uh, and on the right, there is a book um, published by Shi Ming, who's a very famous, who's a very famous leftist pro-Taiwan independence activist. Um, who wrote a book called Taiwan's 400 year history, where he um, Frank, you know, brings up how Taiwan has been repeatedly colonized and how ta um, ta Taiwan's struggle for self-determination has lasted through every uh, colonial period. Um, and then in the middle is a, um, a political pamphlet um, called, um, made by a group called Taiwan Era that was left pro-independence and was active in the US Midwest and in the East Coast. Um, and so they were also, you know, this was the, from the late 60s into the 1970s and early 80s was a time of global um, political change and um, uprisings and social movements. And so um, Taiwanese were inspired by those, right? There were anti-war movements happening. There were decolonization movements happening all over the world. Um, there was the rise of black power, um, late civil rights um, movements happening. Um, and so on the left, um, this is just an image from Peter Huang, who was a sociology graduate student and a member of World United Foremosts for Independence, um, uh, an image from after he attempted to as assassinate Zhang Jingguo, who was then the vice premier of Taiwan in New York outside of the Plaza Hotel. And on the right is a photo of the of a Bao Diao movement demonstration. And this was a movement of um, ethnic Chinese students in the US from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, um, and also including some Chinese Americans that were protesting against the violation of sovereignty um, by both the US and Japan of a disputed um, chain of islands in the South China Sea. And that is a dispute that still continues to this day, but they were participating in these movements that were happening all over this world. And so university campuses then became key sites of political formation and struggle as indicated in this quote by Peter Lin. And he's talking about Madison here. Um, and students both perpetrated and became victims of surveillance by the ROC government. And this is a really interesting dynamic within the Taiwanese community because some of them were being spied on and others of them were being paid um, to be informants on their fellow students. 
Um, and then also some of the um, surveillance was done by, um, by uh, consulate officials as well. Although the conditions of their migration served U.S. interests and depended on the U.S.'s entangled relationship with Taiwan as the Republic of China, Taiwanese student activists fought to make Taiwanese visible and legible as a people subject to injustice and deserving of self-determination. They created far-reaching social networks that served as a lasting infrastructure for trans-Pacific activism, and they also participated and responded to global Sinophone, inter-Asian, and internationalist politics. And so one of the key points throughout the book is that although they went to the US under parameters that were strictly controlled by US Cold War interests, neither the US nor the KMT could control the consequences of that, such flows. Um, as soon as they were released into a world of comparatively more intellectual and political freedom, um, Taiwanese and diaspora immediately began to participate in creative acts of political formation, reading, writing, and organizing. And you're welcome to um, take that URL and browse. You know, this is a Google map of publications available at National Zhengzi University's special collection of overseas Taiwanese political publications. And they're, uh, um, they were all over the world, and, and there are dozens of them. And so this is just to show kind of the, the scale and quantity of, um, of their participation in political discourse. They found each other in the diaspora locally, regionally, and globally, and developed robust connections that ultimately contributed significantly to the end of martial law and de democratization of Taiwan. And one of the important things that I found was how um, important social organizations were to um, creating what um, were essentially concentric circles of politicization. So you might have people who are participating in potlucks or softball tournaments, um, and most of them were doing it purely socially, but then the event organizers would recruit people into the inner circles that would then be doing more delicate, direct activism and organizing. And they really um, depended on the educational networks that they brought with them from Taiwan, um, because the way the Taiwanese educational system worked. A lot of students had been tracked with each other with each other from junior high school on, and so they already had these existing family connections. They knew um, they were often only a couple of degrees apart from each other, and so they could build the trust that was necessary to take risks um, to get involved politically. Um, and this photo on the left is an example of that. That's actually from my parents' backyard in San Diego. Um, I'm there in the bottom left with my mom and my grandma and my brother and my father is um, in the top right. And um, on the it was just a barbecue, but also many of these people were participants in the Formosan Association of Human Rights, which that same year in 1979 were really instrumental in getting the word out after the Kaohsiung incident happened in late 1979. A lot of um, dissidents and uh, uh, democracy and human rights leaders of those movements were arrested and imprisoned and for most an association of human rights was really key in getting the word out and um, advocating for them to have open trials and preventing their execution. Um, and so that was an important moment in the democratization in Taiwan that these kinds of um, social slash community slash political organizations uh, were um, active in um, this is an example that is um, also really fun of those in concentric circles of politicization, and these were the softball tournaments. And so um, this particular photo is of Syracuse University, but Madison um, was also, University of Wisconsin also hosted these softball tournaments where Taiwanese from different associations all over the Midwest would come together, and it served that purpose, that same purpose of a social event that could then be used to recruit people um, into, um, into inner organizing circles. Um, this is a similar fix your own car day, right? Um, organized by the Taiwanese Association of Minnesota. Um, and this was actually in response to, you know, rival students from the Chinese Student Association who were pro um, Guomindang had slashed the tires of some of the students at the tiny student organization. It was the first time many of them had ever driven a car. So they decided that they better learn how to fix their own cars. And then um, this is another example that of the kind of creative organizing that happened through these um, through these Taiwanese associations and Taiwanese student associations. This is um, 
These are brochures from the Voice of Taiwan that was run by a couple in Queens, New York, um, and they had gotten the idea to start a community um, telephone service, um, and they were inspired by the weather service. So those of us who are a little bit older, we can remember that um, when when I was a kid, I could call a phone number and it would give you the weather forecast for the day. And so they decided they would set up a phone number that you could call and learn all about the, the events that were happening for the Taiwanese American Association of New York. Um, but what it very quickly turned into was a um, place where people would call to get the latest news and developments outside of Taiwan. So they were actually the first to report the um, Kaohsiung incident, um, and they have tapes and recordings of the police cracking down on protesters. You know, they they had a direct line to people in Taiwan, and then they had all these networks that were run by Taiwanese in different places where people could call local phone numbers, um, and they even had people calling from Taiwan to find out what was happening in Taiwan because um, the KMT control of information was so rigid within Taiwan. Okay, so, but this same time period, of course, um, overlapped with that 38 year period of martial law and the KMT were surveilling and terrorizing Taiwanese nationals, not only in Taiwan, but also in the US, Japan and other locations. In the US, this happened with the full knowledge and tacit permission of the US state. Through my research and interviews, I found that the KMT's continuous surveillance and oppression of often minor subjects, even outside of Taiwan, became central to the identity and political formation of this generation. Um, kill one, warn a hundred, kill the chicken to warn the monkey. Um, these two traditional Chinese proverbs were regularly referenced by students and activists in interviews and political writing to describe the KMT's intentions when it persecuted individuals for minor or even non-existent offenses. You can see um, other ways that students talked about it. The spies are the eyes of the KMT. Constant surveillance is a way of life for some Taiwanese. Um, we have the habit of watching what we do or read in public. That's the way we were raised. And indeed, from 1964 to 1961, there were dozens of reported instances of KMT spying on Taiwanese students on 21 US campuses, often by paid informants who are sarcastically referred to as professional students. And one interesting thing that I found is that these incidents were covered extensively by campus and local newspapers and to some degree by national and international media, even though they've largely been forgotten um, by collective memory today. Um, at the campus and local level, a KMT informant form um, that was reportedly turned over to UC Berkeley's Daily California newspaper by a former spy in 1976 was widely repented. So you can see the details of the kind of reporting that was happening here, and particularly that overlap between student organizations and perceived um, identification of political enemies by the Kuomintang. So even if you were the head, if you took a leadership position in a Taiwanese student association, as opposed to a Chinese student associ association, to even identify as Taiwanese was, see was seen as subversive and anti-government. And of course, their other enemies were communists who they refer to as Gongfei or communist bandit, bandits. Um, so these reports were part of the, the widespread ROC government surveillance infrastructure called the Tsai Hong or Rainbow Project. And it was named that because Tsai Hong in Mandarin is a homonym for picking or stamping out the red or the communists. Being reported on could mean anything from intimidation, threats of injury or death, and harassment of family in Taiwan to being blacklisted from returning. And many cases did culminate in arrest and imprisonment on return to Taiwan, as was the case with University of Wisconsin PhD student Wang Qiming, who I'll talk about more in a little bit, um, Chen Yuxi, an economics student at University of Hawaii's East West Center um, in 1968, Rita Ye, Ye Dalei, a former PhD student in sociology at University of Minnesota, Minnesota and Chen Zhanran, a UCLA PhD student in sociology in 1991. So even after the end of martial law, these kinds of cases were still ha happening. And then other cases culminated in death as was the fate in 1981 of Chen Wenzheng, an assistant professor of statistics at Carnegie Mellon, who was found dead on the campus of National Taiwan University in Taipei after being taken in for questioning by the Taiwan Garrison Command the day before. For the KMT, such practices were in a, many ways a continuation of their extensive battles against the Chinese Communist Party 
for the hearts and minds of students on Chinese campuses in the 1930s and 40s. Um, but the KMT was far from unique in its extensive surveillance and terrorization of its nationals in the US during the late Cold War. Students became particular targets for surveillance among authoritarian ruled US allies, in addition to Taiwan, most notably Iran. The problem of regulating the intelligence agencies of Cold War friendlies, some of whom had been trained and established by the CIA itself to further US interests, was widely known and discussed at a national level in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In 1978, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence had produced a report on the activities of friendly foreign intelligence services in the US, focusing on the activities of the Korean CIA, which determined that collectively the Department of State, the FBI, and the CIA had neither the will nor the capacity to surveil or mitigate the activities of such agents. In 1981, Congress again took up the issue of spying, specifically with regard to Taiwan after Tsen Wen Tsung's death, with two extensive hearings in July and October of that year. And that photo is of Tsen Wen Tsung's widow, Tsen Su Tsen, um, at a memorial in Pittsburgh right after he was killed. None of these hearings and reports, however, resulted in systematic government action or change. As a result, as racialized non-US nationals engaged in internal struggles against their own government, a US ally, Taiwanese student migrants were neither fully legible to nor protected by dominance right, dominant rights-based moral and political regimes, um, civil or human. They were fully aware of their vulnerability and they sought to protect newly arrived Taiwanese students from harm as well as inform the broader public. So for example, in an incident at North Carolina State University in 1983, two members of the Taiwanese Student Association were arrested and charged with illegal advertising for hanging posters around campus that accused the vice president of the Chinese Student Association of being a spy. In a letter to the university administration, one of the two, Pei Horn Guo, expressed the political consciousness and tactical goals behind their actions. And he said, the students I represent have learned that unless we stand up united behind one another, a historical tragedy will once again unfold before us. In this spirit, the main reason we hung posters around campus was to alert newly arrived students to the necessity of being cautious and on guard at all times, not to mistakenly think that we too are to enjoy the freedoms of America. And he goes on, we also intended to appeal to the fairness of American friends and to motivate them. You can read the rest there. Um, so, but what I want to point out that is that he was si simultaneously calling out the failures and appealing to the promises of American ideals. Um, Asian American studies scholar Ling Chi Wang, who himself was a Chinese student migrant, later theorized this state of existence as living under what he called a structure of dual domination, subject to both U.S. racism and KMT state oppression at once. And Wang's theorization was based in part on his own personal experience of persecution by the KMT in the US, as well as his activism related to the case of ROC national Henry Liu Liu Yilang, Yilang, an author who was assassinated on KMT orders in California in 1984. So that is kind of like an overview of this dialectic of activism and surveillance that was politicized, that uh, Taiwanese students in the US were experiencing and that shaped their political consciousness very strongly. Um, so going back to Madison, right, you can see here in the Midwest in this map, there's a cluster of events there. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the specifics of and importance of Madison in this story. Um, so a lot of Taiwanese of this generation um, ended up going to big public universities in the Midwest. And part of that was because um, a lot of Midwestern universities were offering them competitive TA ships and RA ships. And most um, Taiwanese identified students um, were coming from um, working class or lower middle class backgrounds, right? And so if they could pay resident tuition and the, if they had financial support, they were more able to come to these places. And so they tended to cluster, you know, a lot came to University of Wisconsin, Kansas State University was another place. Um, and then they found each other and they networked. Um, and so I'm just gonna skip ahead for a second here. And so um, the University of Wisconsin actually had one of the earliest Taiwanese student associations translated here as the Formosan Club. And this is the um, student organization registration form that I found in special collections several year years ago that shows it being established in 1963. And you can see that 
idea of the concentric circles of organizing there because they say, you know, type of organization, social, cultural, and recreational, non-political. But then, um, let's see, uh, two years later, this organization is filed um, as a student, is um, uh, registered as a student organization. It's called the Foremost in Affairs Study Group. Um, and I have made this window too small for me to <laughs> read the text there, but um, but it's explicitly, you know, studying politics. Let's see. They had um, in their in their um, mission and their goals, right, to um, to seriously study the politics of Taiwan. And there was actually a lot of overlap between these two groups, um, and they were tactically organizing themselves, right? So one could be a purely social group and one would be a more political group. However, this second group did get the members of it on the radar of the KMT. And the person there you see on the third line, Jim Huang, um, he, he is actually Huang Qiming and he was in 1967 um, arrested on a short, what he had intended to be a short stop in Taiwan to see his family before going to do research in Japan, um, but he was detained by um, the Taiwanese government and um, imprisoned and um, it, with and put on trial for treason, um, primarily for his activities with the Foremost and Affairs Study Group at University of Wisconsin. And so um, University of Wisconsin was definitely a node for um, Taiwanese independence activists and also for um, people on the left, you know, Maoists, some of whom were who were also from Taiwan, but from Hong Kong and other places as well. And so um, people who were who went to these KMT orientation sessions, they would have students go to mandatory orientation sessions before they went to the US. And um, my father, before he came to University of Wisconsin, he recalled being told by the KMT officer, um, in charge of that training, you know, be careful going to Madison because it's the headquarters of the communists and Taiwanese independence people. And this was actually true. <laughs> so, so Huang Qiming, you know, coming to um, Madison in 1963, you can see here um, in that form in 1963, um, what name is he using there? Yeah, James C. M. Huang as secretary in 1963, um, there was already um, two active members of the of United Formosans for Independence here, and that was Professor Zhou Shunming, um, who's there in the white shirt and the tie in the middle, and then also his wife, um, Wu Xiuhui, who had already been blacklisted for their pro taiwan and independence activities. And so Huang Qiming is in this picture as well. This is 1965, the Madison um, International Day Parade. Um, Huang, Huang Qiming is the person in the khaki jacket, third from the left there. And that's Robin Fleming, who um, at that time was either the vice president or the chancellor, um, I'm different. I, I believe the vice, vice president of University of Wisconsin and his wife. And so um, this event was very important to them because um, they were asserting Formosa as its own country separate from Republic of China. Um, and so, um, so the, these networks of students were, were very much present at University of Wisconsin. And, and as soon as students from Taiwan came to Madison, they would be immersed in these Sinophone or Chinese speaking worlds of politics. Um, so this is a telegram from Fred Harrington who is president of the University of Wisconsin, an urgent telegram to Secretary of State Dean Rusk, you know, asking, appealing for um, help with Huang Qiming's case um, and um, trying to free him from being um, convicted and um, imprisoned. And he was in fact convicted, but then he was released in less than a year, um, which was very unusual for that time. But he was not able to come back to the US even though he tried very hard to do so. Um, the other very interesting thing about Huang Qiming's case, and this is um, chapter three of my book. So if you wanna know more, there's a lot more there. Um, is that he was the research assistant. He was one of Douglas Mendel's uh, main research assistants and uh, for the politics of foremost nationalism. And Douglas Mendel was a political scientist um, who was then at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And he wrote one of the only full length scholarly books looking at 
Taiwan independence activism outside of Taiwan. Um, and uh, this was the only book in English um, for a long time. Um, and what was really interesting to me is how much Mandel's work drew from the labor of these Taiwanese research assistants, many of whom were, um, were who were um, in the U.S. at that time. So uh, Huang Qiming's letters um, to Douglas Mandel are held in Douglas Mandel's papers at the University of Washington Special Collections. And he wrote to him, you know, once or twice a week for over two years, their personal letters, their research letters, and so much of um, the legwork that he did and also direct quotations are in the politics of foremost and nationalism. So I think there's a story there about area studies research and um, international students too. Um, that And this is also a specifically um, Madison story as well, or Wisconsin story, you know, between Madison and Milwaukee. And um, this is just some one of the things that Huang Chimi wrote in one of his letters to Douglas Mandel. There's something missing to discuss Taiwan problems without having a Taiwanese scholar in the field, don't you think so? You know, so I just thought his his sort of absent presence in that book is really interesting, combined with this history of having been surveilled, arrested, and imprisoned on the basis of his activities in Madison. Um, and his story had a very tragic ending too. You know, so he was not able to come back to the U.S. And then in the late 1970s, um, he uh, Douglas Mendel went back to Taiwan to give a lecture. And then Huang Qiming um, drove him to the place he was giving the lecture. And then after he dropped him off, Huang Qiming himself was killed in a mysterious car accident that many believed was the doing of the KMT. Um, so I was really interested in this story as a kind of shadow story to um, this relatively well-known book, you know, um, in the absence of other books about Taiwanese American activism. Um, and um, and it's interesting in all these different ways. One as a history of um, foreign students in area studies, um, but also as a story of um, so much that was happening um, here in Madison. And um, <clears throat> I'll just close with, <laughs> This um, image, this is kind of just a teaser for my talk tomorrow um, at the geography department um, where I'll be talking a lot in more detail about um, Madison as the headquarters of the communists and Taiwanese independence people because um, they were sometimes actually the same people. You know, um, there were uh, left, people on the left who were pro-Taiwan independence. There were Maoists who were, you know, and even this was during the period of time where um, the PRC was reaching out to Taiwanese because they had a common enemy in the Guomindang, right? And uh, Mao himself, you know, up to a certain point so that he too supported Taiwan independence. Um, so it was this really interesting moment that um, was also very much alive in Madison and the larger Midwest in these Chinese speaking worlds of student migrants who were coming to Midwestern campuses. Um, Okay, so you know some of the takeaway points for the book from the book, um, which you probably um, already know if you've been able to read the book, um, but just want to kind of lay them out for you there. Um, and then these would be the credits if this were a film. <laughs> um, the experiences of this generation are uh, really urgent to capture at this time. Um, this book took me 12 years from my first interview to when it was finally finished. It was really hard for me to do as someone who's trained as an Asian Americanist, um, you know, but I felt it was really important to do because it was the history that I grew up with. And, but it was very little, it's been very little known outside of the Taiwanese American community and even within the Taiwanese American community because there hasn't been that kind of scholarly attention to it in English. Um, and then this gives you a sense of the path of the research interviews, archives. This is also in the back of the book. Um, so I wanna make sure I leave plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for a wonderful talk. Um, so we have time for some questions. Uh, if people would like to raise their uh, icon hand, or if uh, you can um, put the camera on and raise your hand, that's fine as well. 
or you're welcome to uh, throw a question into the um, chat. Uh, but if you raise a hand, we can also, uh, Essie can help you to unmute to ask a question. Lori's unmuted in case you wanted to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find the raise hand thing. <laughs> That's um, okay. Go right ahead, Lori. All right. Well, first, I want to thank you for this talk. It is super interesting. And I have I have a comment and then a question. And my comment is that, um, you know, as I'm listening, I didn't know much of this history, even though kind of I, this my focus on campus is on U.S. and China region relations. And I did not know these stories. There's always been kind of a hole for me in the time when um, I know the students post, like when China was reopening and then early Chinese students, but I haven't known this time period that well. So it's super interesting. It fills in some gaps for me. And so my comment is that as you're talking about this um, surveillance that was happening you know, right now in the archives, there's these boxes that were just donated to us from the family of a student who graduated in, in 1927, Peng Wenning, mm. and he was persecuted. He was he was trained in politics here on our campus, and then went off to become an activist. And he was persecuted by both the communists and the Kuomintang, and died in China. Uh, um, young because he was oppressed so you know he was kind mm -hmm. of struggled against in the cultural revolution He's, he was labeled a rightist not in the cultural revolution before the cultural revolution anyway it's just as a reminder that these are not new issues you know they go way back to the activism of our students from from the from the from china taiwan hong kong it's always been happening on our campus and it's been kind of in, a, in its own world and not known by the greater community, which I, I think is interesting. So, and that's related to my, so that's a comment that this stuff goes way back in time, even before what you, the period you're studying. And then my question is, at the very end of your book, you talk about how do we remove the shroud from Taiwanese student stories? And so I wondered if you had some thoughts on how to do that, because that is, that is a big question I have, how to make this kind of story better known as a university and, uh, you know, as a, as a Wisconsin, as a, you know, for the Wisconsin people of Wisconsin, it's a Wisconsin story. You know, do you have any recommendations mm -hmm. for us? Well, I have a not very practical recommendation, which is that I've always thought that this would make an amazing TV series, <laughs> you know, because um, it's so, I mean, it's an interesting moment. I live in LA, you know, and I know, uh, and it's an interesting moment where Asian American representation is being broadened, you know, and um, just the, I think it's part of it is, is getting those personal stories, you know, the interviews, the, um, that first person voice of, um, so people then identify with them as human beings, you know, and can really think about the complexities of that. Um, even for the ones who were doing the informing, you know, a lot of them, them were doing that under pressure because they were, um, some of them were just, you know, flat out patriotic, like Ma Ying-jo, the former president of Taiwan, who very proudly informed on his fellow students at Harvard, you know, um, because he felt it was his patriotic duty, but others were afraid something was gonna happen to their families if they didn't, you know, cooperate. Um, and so I think the humanness of those stories is what will make people actually care about them, right? And um, you're absolutely right that there is a longer history of that by both the CCP and the KMT. And they were doing that, you know, they were competing on, co on college campuses in mainland China to try to win the hearts and minds of students, right? In the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and what was interesting to me is I read an article about that that said that the KMT, after studying the effects of their surveillance on um, Chinese campuses before they went to Taiwan, they concluded that it, um, it was a failure, you know, <laughs> that their methods were a failure, but then they went and they did the same thing anyway, you know, in Taiwan and the U.S. So I don't have an easy answer for it. You know, I think 
my book was a way to just try to open the door to those histories, you know, and I think also um, they're not unique to Taiwanese students and Chinese students, you know, they're um, students from Iran, from Korea, from the Philippines, right? Um, we're all reporting being spied upon. Um, there is a story of a Libyan student who was assassinated by a government, a Libyan government agent, right? But these are, there was of course like a bright line between like allies of the US government and enemies of the US government and how those kinds of extraterritorial um, um, murders were treated. Um, but I think maybe trying to make those connections of thinking about um, international students as um, active participants in global history, you know, rather than like sojourners or people who are not connected to those complex processes in politics, you know, so um, maybe it would be something about, you know, sharing this kind of work with present day international students and giving them a voice and leadership and, you know, talking about those histories to the extent that they can, right, depending on where they're coming from. Um, but I think it's a bigger, it's bigger than just Taiwanese students, right, but it's about certain uh, figures in American history who are not seen as full historical subjects, if that makes sense. <laughs> Very broad answer. Yes, Ben. Hello. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Wendy, for the talk um, and for the book. As uh, Yosha Sen or a st <laughs> student in um, a graduate student from Taiwan, um, I really appreciated um, like learning more about this history and um, being represented in this sort of way. Um, I would like to ask. Um, because your book mostly focuses on sort of the 60s and to the 80s, the Cold War during that mm -hmm. period. Um, do you have any um, thinking about um, Tiananmen Sijian, um, the Tiananmen mm -hmm. incident and like later the the from 80s to 89, the, the Cold War during that period? Um, do you have any insights in terms of how um, Taiwanese American sort of uh, students or um, responded to the circumstances of the 80s um, as well, um, like after all this, um, like sort of political organizing during the 60s, from 60s to like 1980? Yeah, so I there's a there's one group I write about in chapter two, the Taiwan Revolutionary Party, um, and they were very interesting because they were students during this time period, um, and so mostly I follow this generation. So I don't know what Taiwanese um, students who were coming, you know, in the eighties and nineties, what their politics were like. I mean, sorry, like late eighties, you know, uh, when the Tiananmen suggest happened. Um, I don't know what was actually happening on campus, but I do know that some of the um, student activists from the time period I write about, at least the Taiwan Revolutionary Party, um, they were very supportive of democratization, um, uh, democracy struggles in China and tried to build, you know, um, alliances between, um, between democracy activists and actually create a platform for um, democracy activists in China, because they also thought that if they cared for the fate of Taiwan, um, their conclusion was that they should support the democratization of China, you know, because that would be actually in Taiwan's best interests as well. You know, so there are some groups that did try to make those connections. But um, if your question is specifically about students during that time period, I didn't research that time period. But it would be a great project <laughs> for somebody to do. Yeah. Wendy, can I ask you a question about, uh, as you're thinking through this time period, about interactions between, as you describe, um, students from, international students um, who are politicized and, and, and active in terms of struggles in their home countries, about the interaction between perhaps students, or, or the extent of that between students from Taiwan, but also other parts of the world, as you're describing, that this, you know, isn't unique to Taiwan, even as the sort of 
complexities and contradictions that they had to grapple with are obviously sort of specific to that history. But were there forms uh, of of solidarity or support um, that that sort of cross between uh, uh, different student organizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I didn't find a lot of that, and. Um... I think one of the reasons was because the fields that they were coming into, right, STEM fields, um, most of their personal and political lives were still conducted in Chinese, you know, at least in those student days. And so, um, and then also um, there's a book called Radicals on the Road by Judy Wu, um, where she talks about how a lot of the um, social movement groups in the U.S. were, um, you know, very interested in Maoism, very interested in socialist Vietnam and so on, right? But but Taiwan also was illegible in that way to other student activists because um, that distinction between Taiwanese people and the Republic of China and the Kuomintang, you know, um, I don't think that was very clear to broader publics. Um, so it, I think the, both of those things created a barrier, right? One that they were struggling against their own government and but were not necessarily seen by others as um, separate from that government, which I, I think is still an issue um, among the US and broader Western left today, right? Um, that idea of Taiwan as, um, as a, a US ally in a particular way that doesn't think about those layered histories of colonization. And, the, and so they tended to mostly organize um, with then uh, talk to and organize with other Chinese speaking communities, which was still quite global, right? They were talking to students from Hong Kong, they were talking to Chinese Americans, um, but they were, and even though in their publications, there there's a lot of interest in creating solidarity with different groups and they're reading about um, decolonization movements and you know um, translating and publishing things about decolonization movements all over the world. I didn't find any evidence of um, actual solidarity building. Um, the one exception to that is the case of Ten Ishi, which happened um, out of University of Hawaii. And that was a really interesting one because there, were, and in this way, the language could cross over because um, in that case, there, um, the overlap between Chinese and Japanese speaking people histories in Taiwan um, made certain kinds of connections possible. So there were um, activists in Japan on the left who were anti-Japanese imperialism, you know, who are so supportive of um, Kore Korean and Chinese in Japan who were organizing with activists in Hawaii. <laughs> and then in that case, Students for a Democratic Society also got involved. Um, and I think that just had to do with the particular um, political world that was happening in Honolulu and through the East West Center, you know, but in most places it didn't happen. It's not comparable to, for example, um, there's a new book called, I think it's called The Flame Within uh, by Manije Maradian about Iranians who were coming to the US during the same time period. And a lot of them went to HBCUs and actually did build solidarity with um, black power activists and, you know, other kinds of things. And so um, I'd like to think more about the, those kinds of comparative things you know I do think language was a big one right how much access pe people were had to English during that time and then if they were legible or not to other activist groups thank you um there's a question in the chat that I will uh, read uh from uh, SC Liang uh do you know if there were many students from Taiwan who could involved in political groups unintentionally and were then reported. Um, so yeah, so, so I think this is an interesting question. So the very last slide that I had to go through kind of quickly, but that idea of being accidental activists, this did happen to people because as you saw in the informant form, um, they ask who is the leader of the Taiwanese Student Association, you know, and you have to name the leadership. So even to be a leader of a, a predominantly social group, you know, a, a group that was mostly doing social things could get you in trouble. And this, in fact, um, happened to my father and other people as well, you know, because my father was the vice president of the Taiwanese Student Association. And at some point, they helped raise money for the um, victims of a coal mining accident in Taiwan. And this was seen as 
you know, a socialist act <laughs> by the KMT government. And so um, because of that, my father um, had wanted to go back to Taiwan to be a professor at his alma mater at Tsinghua. But when he applied for that job, he got a letter back from a government agent saying, don't come back. There's no job for you, you know. And so a lot of people, these kind, they did very minor things. And then because they found out they were black, blacklisted, then they went, they just figured, I have nothing to lose now, so I'm going to do more, you know. So, so yes, to, there were many people who did not intend to be activists who were caught up in this and then had to make decisions accordingly. Thank you. Um, I see that we are at time already. Um, so, uh, I've, first of all, I'll, I'll say if you'd like to hear more um, about um, Wendy's work, then you're, everybody's welcome to join for the um, geography lecture tomorrow, which will be 3.30 in uh, Science Hall 180. Um, but for now, um, please join me again to say thank you to Professor Wendy Chang for a wonderful and illuminating talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for attending the event, everybody, and look out for future emails about this event and uh, others that we'll be running uh, in the near future.